So how do we, okay. how do we, um, how do we progress in this? So, well, we also thought like, let's look to if we can find some, some other uh, related systems. So one of the places where we've gone a lot is Yellowstone National Park. And here we have Carissa uh, sampling at, uh, the obsidian pool, one of the famous hot springs in there. So we've sampled all over um, the world. Uh, and we also got samples from, from uh, colleagues uh, looking for these so-called nano archaeota. Uh, and they are only present in high temperature environments. Uh, now, the, the current phylum that's called nano archaeota, they, they've, they've played with this taxonomy. So now they, they included in that some other lineages which are not thermophilic. But when I refer to the nano archaeota that we study, it's the original Stetter uh, lineage, and they are all thermophilic. And we see this in, in hot springs all over the world, and they seem to group by the location. So there, there's a biogeography in here, and there's, there's uh, lineages from, from hot springs, and then there's lineages that are marine, uh, and they seem to be distinct. So we thought like, okay, how do we get to actually culture uh, some of these uh, novel ones? So we had cultures of the, of the nanorchium equitans, available and we said like well we, we actually also needed them as a reagent um, to make an antibody and basically track them in culture so we 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 made a polyclonal we, we made a, a, an anti-sera polyclonal anti-sera by injecting cells into rabbits and so we got that 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 uh, uh, that that anti-sera and of course if you label uh, the igg with a fluorescent dye then then you can visualize the cells in in a culture so here we have the nanoarchaeum cells, which are which are fluorescing in red, and we got the DAPI staining for the DNA uh, in blue and in green. We had another antibody uh, that we raised against uh, the host. So we um, we thought like, well, you know, if, if somehow these these antibody anti uh, uh, anti nanoarchaeum uh, IgGs uh would be uh would they might cross react with the the proteins that are present on other nanarchia so maybe we could actually use them to fish out other nanarchia and we have a uh in my lab at the ornl we have a, a, a flow cytometer uh, sorter uh and we've used that actually a, a lot to do single cell genomics and I'm, I'm sure everybody's familiar with the principle of flow, uh, flow cytometry and cell sorting. Basically, you, you put all your um, mix of cells uh, in every, they go one by one in, in, in front of a, of a laser or multiple lasers. And then they are, they're, um, they're interrogated in terms of size, uh, structure, fluorescence level, so on. And then you can, you can decide whether a particular population of cells that has the characteristics you're looking for uh, you want to retrieve them or not. And you can isolate them as single particles or single cells. So we've been using that a lot to do single cell genomics where you put a single cell in a, in a well and then you amplify it and you can uh, sequence it uh, and, and see what that cell was. And we've been also then using that uh, in a non-destructive way to actually deposit such cells either in liquid media in 96 well plates or to essentially deposit them on a, on a plate uh, of agar and then let them grow into colonies. Uh, so to essentially get pure clones in, in, one, in one step. So we applied that uh, to some samples that uh, we, we got from Obsidian Pool uh, in, in Yellowstone, where these nanoarchaea are actually quite uh, rare in that. They're, they're less than 0.1% of the community in, in that. Uh, but using that antibody that we raised against equitans, uh, we, we obtained, we got some fluorescent cells, and I, I know this doesn't really, it, it, it's not, it doesn't show very well on, on this picture, uh, but in this gate, there were, there were few fluorescent cells, uh, and we, uh, we isolated them and we sequenced them, and essentially we, we discovered a novel uh, nanoarchaeota uh, lineage in the obsidian pool, and those cells were attached to their host. So they came together with the host. So we, we found out what that archaeon was. And it was a thermo uh, acidophile. It was a thermophilic acidophile um, that uh, this particular Yellowstone nanarchaeon uh, uh, lives on. So knowing that it was a, a, an acidophile, we, we then focused on various cultivation media and conditions 
to favor the growth of these types of uh, acidophiles. And we went to another hot spring in Yellowstone, uh, cistern springs, where we knew that they were a little bit more abundant in an obsidian pool. And we actually got to find, in the end, to enrich and then purify and isolate uh, one of these uh, novel nanoarchaea we call the nanopusillus, uh, and it lives on another archaeon, uh, acidulobus. Um, that that is a it, it's a it's a heterotroph uh, in that particular uh, environment. So we and then of course we we then applied a variety of omics. We did the sequencing and we did proteomics, and you know we found out that this is very similar to the nanoarchaeum equitans, but the genome of this was not as reduced. It actually had some a little bit of meta metabolism, but instead it was act, act, uh, lacking ATP synthase. So this particular one. Uh, it clearly has to make ATP just by substrate level phosphorylation. It has no, does not seem to have a, a membrane uh, ATPase uh, and probably uh, not even a membrane potential. Um, so it, essentially what it looks like, it, it, all these lineages, they're, they're all parasitic, they're all related, but each one of them evolves sort of independently in terms of what kind of genes it loses probably depending on, on the host that it interacts with. And since then, uh, there was another uh, nanorchiota system that it, uh, one of our collaborators, uh, Annalise Reisenbach at Portland State, uh, isolated from, uh, from a New Zealand hot spring uh, and uh, nanoclepta. And, and that one was also related to these other ones that we had. And it had another uh, also crenarchiota um, uh, host. So, We've we've kind of we're we're learning about these systems as as we study them and as we discover more uh, using these evolutionary approaches to compare uh, to compare them. Um, so let me now jump to um, the to the human side, uh, where uh, you you'll see now that you know there's this sort of exotic lineages, very low abundance uh, that have been uncultured for a long time. Now, if we actually look at the uh, human microbiome. There are actually such lineages in there as well. Now, they're not nanoarchaeota, but there are other ones. So in, in the human mouth, in the oral microbiota, there have been three lineages known for a long time, just based on 16S uh, sequences. And they used to be called TM7, uh, SR1, and GNO2. They, they had these uh, uh, candidate uh, divisions, uh, uh, abbreviations. Uh, now, since then, of course, now every, you know people don't like this kind of abbreviation, so now people feel like giving them sort of Latin-based name, even though they're not uh, uh, legitimately described uh, taxa. So they've now been called Saccharibacteria bacteria and Gracilli bacteria and Abscon beta bacteria, uh, and they are all present at low abundance. They're 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 less than one percent. But there's, they are diverse. There's about 14 different phylotypes of, of uh, TM7. I, I still call them by the, by the old names. Um, and then several of the GNO2 and, and SR1. So we kind of focused our attention to, to these groups, even though they are low abundance. Uh, they're they're line really lineages that have not been cultured from any other environment. They're actually present in a lot of other environments, not only in the human mouth. So. Uh, it was an interesting aspect to see like, well, let's see what can, can we get of any of them. So because there were no relatives in culture that we could use the same way as we use the nano archaeota to design those, uh, to, to use those polyclonal uh, uh, antibodies, uh, we clearly wanted to find a way that we could selectively isolate them, especially since they're a low abundance. So simply random plating would, would not work. Otherwise, people would have cultured them by now. So how do you get essentially a needle from a haystack uh, if you're really looking for that needle? So we, of course, we would need a way to find that needle and, and, and get, get it away from, from all the noise in there. Uh, so we, we said like, okay, what do we know about these microbes? So we know now more than 16S, there, there are genomes based on metagenomes and based on single cell genomes. So can we find a way to look at the genome and use that information to physically isolate. Because we know if we simply look at the infirm metabolisms, we're not good enough, uh, or there are things in there that prevent us to, to design a selectable uh, cultivation approach based on the physiology. So we need a physical approach to basically fish them out. We need a hook. 
So one potential hook without killing the cell, obviously we want to grow them, is to use membrane proteins uh, as, as, the, as the hook because, or not as the hook, as the target, because they are sitting on the surface and they will be exposed whether the cell is live or, or alive or dead. So we thought like, well, if we can pick some, some membrane proteins to design antibodies, uh, to, it, that would allow us to, to, to have, a, to have a, a hook. Uh, to, to pick them out from the, from the very diverse micro, microbial sample. So we were like, okay, so we can look for a protein that is going to be uh, selective enough to, to get such an antibody. And then if we get an antibody and it works, in theory, we should be able to label those cells and isolate them. And if those cells happen to interact with other cells, we can, we can get them along. So we could even potentially identify novel, novel symbiosis. And of course, we can confirm those by sequencing to see that we're, we're getting what, we're, what we want. So this is a, a study that, that we published uh, now, it's, it's two years ago, uh, and, and Carissa uh, led that, that study. And so what, how did we actually do it? So when we started this some, some years ago, uh, there was some single cell genomic data from a TM7 that came from Steve Quake's lab and, and David, uh, David Relman's lab uh, at Stanford. Uh, so we, we looked at that sequence data and that's when we essentially picked up, picked two proteins, a penicillin binding protein and a capsular uh, polysaccharide biosynthesis protein, which we infer that they will be on the cell surface and based on data from other organisms, we knew that they are probably well expressed. So we designed, we, we picked up a, a region of those and we designed peptides that were then used to raise antibodies to do the, the fishing. Now, while we were actually doing this research, a, a group from UCLA actually isolated the first TM7 and they found out it was a parasite on an actinobacterium so we kind of got scooped on that, but they they used the they 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 were really uh, lucky because apparently that TM7 and the host were streptomycin resistant. So they essentially played its cells on streptomyces, and in the end they got they got one of these uh, microbes to grow. Uh, but we so we we kind of carried along and and used that that approach which we call targeted reverse genomics, and and we also isolated several of these. Uh, we, we, th those particular antibodies, they worked in making some cells fluorescent, and we, we, we sorted those cells out, we did single cell sequencing, we confirmed that those were TM7, and then we applied them on different types of media, and we were successful in isolating multiple phylotypes of TM7, uh, along with their hosts, which were uh, part of the genus Actinomyces. Yeah, so when we did that and compared, we put essentially a tree. This on the left, it's the TM7 tree based on 16S data, and on the right is the uh, oral actinomyces tree. We saw that different TM7 use different actinomyces as a host. So there, there doesn't seem to be uh, they're they're not promiscuous, but but they're not super specific either. We actually found some TM7 that appear to be able to use two hosts. Uh, so, of course, the, the question is, what dictates the specificity of interaction uh, and how, you know, did they co-evolve or, or, or what, what's going on there? Uh, so th there's, um, there's now other researchers, of course, including the ones that, uh, that originally isolated TM7. And in the meantime, they actually moved to the, uh, um, to the Forsyth Institute in Cambridge. Uh, and uh, so they've also isolated a number of these, um, uh, and, and there's, there's actually more than what I've shown you in that tree now, uh, and we're starting to better understand the interaction between the different TM7 and their hosts and the specificity, uh, although we, we really don't have any clue about the mechanism of it. We simply see that some species associated with others, but not with, I mean, with some, but not with others. And very recently, actually, there's been the first uh, TM, free living TM7 from an open environment, uh, from, from a wastewater uh, treatment plant uh, that was isolated by a group in, in um, Australia. And you, you see that on, on this picture. There are also these tiny cocci that, that, in, that, that parasitize uh, on an actinobacterium. And they've also characterized uh, uh, this particular uh, TM7 
and it, it is a, it is a parasite. They actually isolated it by by looking for phages. So they use the phage approach, uh, looking for plaques, uh, to get phages uh, uh, against the bacterium. That's a problem in wastewater treatment. And instead of a phage, they actually got a, a TM7. Uh, of course, if they would have gotten a phage, it would not have come out in nature and microbiology. But they got a TM7, so that that really was a big deal. Uh, so we're we're really trying to understand more about about TM7. But there's also other ones in in the in the oral microbiome, like I mentioned, SR1. And uh, a number of years ago, we actually got a single cell for an SR1. And we found out that it actually had a different genetic recoding that was previously unknown. Uh, so these types of bacteria are actually using the, the, the UGA uh, stop codon to encode for glycine. Uh, UGA is used by mycoplasmas, for example, to encode for tryptophan, but this was a novel recoding. So now in, if, if you look in GenBank at the genetic codes, uh, genetic code 25, it's for SR1 and, and GNO2. Uh, and we really found this based on one single cell uh, that we sequenced. And then a collaborator from uh, Dieter Sol at Yale, uh, they did a biochemistry and then they confirmed that indeed uh, that recoding is, is happening in, in vivo. Uh, now, since then, we've actually sequenced a variety of other uh, GNO2 and SR1 cells uh, from both from, from human and from dogs. And uh, there's, there's also some sequence from open environment. And we now know that um, what, what we've seen is that they, they all have this recoding, uh, but if one looks at the density of, of recoded proteins and codons, it, it's not really uniform. In mycoplasmas, essentially everything is recoded. Uh, but in these organisms, you, you see the, the, the shades of gray, they're, they're not uniform. And some of them have more recoded than, than others. So this really, this process is happening and it, it's, it's unclear why what the role does it have or does it actually have a role or it's simply the consequence that these are small genomes and they're very AT rich they're over 70 percent AT uh, so that could be a consequence uh, of this particular type of, uh, of shift in the nucleotide composition this this recoding uh, now of course we are very interested in in actually isolating some in culture uh, and more recently, we've kind of shifted from the antibodies. I mean, as, as you know, and th those are difficult to get. You have to get the protein, you have to inject it into an animal, rabbit or, or, or chicken, and then wait, and then, then bleed them. And then you get a polyclonal serum, and you don't know what proteins it's raised against. So th there's a lot of complications. Uh, so more recently, we've actually uh, shifted from antibodies to synthetic antibodies uh, or nanobodies, which are derived from the camelid uh, antibodies, which are just two chains. And if you if one just takes the antigen binding domain, these are small. They're 15 kilodaltons, and we we established in the lab uh, we we got a yeast display uh, library uh, approach uh, that was designed by uh, Manglick and, and Cruz. And essentially, you can, you can find nanobodies against the target protein in a matter of a couple of weeks. Uh, and they behave like a monoclonal antibody because they will be, you, so you can get clones that are reactive to different portions of that target. They're much smaller in size. So they, in theory, they should permeate better to the target on the cells. So we've really been using this. And so we now have actually uh, both antibodies and nanobodies uh, targeting uh, one protein that's that's uh, present on SR1 and GNO2. Uh, so we've been using this for a while. Uh, problem is right now, I yeah, well, the, the number of people that can work on this is uh, has gone down dramatically in my lab. Uh, but we actually have some preliminary data that that we we actually got some cultures uh, both SR1 and GNO2. Uh, they don't seem to want to be domesticated, so we kind of lose them. Uh, but we're having some ideas on what kind of microbes they might be interacting with and who can serve as a host. But it's still, it's a, it's a working, it's a very slow working progress. Uh, we've also recently uh, started to use another platform that allows high throughput cultivation. Uh, and it's called a prospector, and essentially 
so we're trying to integrate this with some of the targeted uh, single cell genomics. So we don't put the cells on plates in 96 well or on solid, but we could potentially bring them into this. And there essentially it's a, it's a nano array that has over 6,000 nanoliter uh, wells. So you, you fill that one um, by capillarity and then incubate it under various conditions. And then you read that in, into an instrument that, that can look at the fluorescence in every well and detect the, the potential cell wells where there was growth. And then the instrument can automatically pick the wells that one selects and deposits them into a 96 well plate, for example, with liquid media. So you expand them and then you can characterize them. So this really can dramatically increase the throughput of cultivation. And there are some labs that are using this to isolate microbes uh, um, from, you know, fecal, uh, from fecal samples or from, for other samples. One can get hundreds and hundreds of isolates in essentially in one step, much faster than just by doing traditional plating. Uh, so this is something that, that's recent. Uh, so let me end with just another slide or two uh, on another kind of project that's more of a pet type project uh, that, that came out of, uh, you know, working with the, the, the dog samples for the oral. So, and it really has to do with, understand, again, understanding the origins and evolution of the mammalian microbiota. So we, we know, but ba based on sequence data, that, that most of that evolution is it's a co-evolution with the host. So we have distinct microbes than the microbes of, of uh, apes, then the mice and so on. So we, you know, we could hypothesize that the, the closest microbes to the human microbiome are actually in apes. And if we look at dogs, we could say like, well, you know, the, the, the closest ancestor to, to uh, dogs were, were the gray wolves. So there's probably a lot of inheritance of microbes um, uh, from the original uh, host. But then, of course, the question is, we've been living with dogs for a couple of thousand years, and, you know, we, you know, get pretty close to dogs, and probably our ancestors got even closer. They were sharing the same bone. Uh, so there was a, there's a lot of opportunities for horizontal transfer of the microbes. And, of course, that has a lot of consequences in terms of emerging pathogens, uh, we, could maybe, we could either pick up things from, from our, our friends that, that can lead to disease or, or they can pick up things from us that they can lead to disease. But it's also an opportunity to understand this, this co-evolution and interspecies interactions, not only between host and the microbe, but also between microbes. So we, we thought like, well, let's, let's do a little bit of test or let's look in, into this without you know, a lot of effort. We didn't have really specific funding for this. So it was, was more of a side project. So we got back to Yellowstone because we know that in Yellowstone, there, there's wolves in there. We, I, I didn't want to do this with animals in the zoo because you know, they are, most of them are born in the zoo. They're in contact with humans all the time. They're in contact with with food that's not natural. There's, so there's a lot of confounding aspects there. So let's go to the actual wild wolves. And um, of course there's packs of wolves in Yellowstone and they are, they are studied all the time. Uh, you know, there's the, the wolf project in Yellowstone. Uh, Doc Smith is, is leading that. Uh, and they agreed they, uh, as part of their uh, annual uh, sort of coloring of the wolves and they, they, they tranquilize some of them and then they do uh, biological measurements, they take blood samples and so on. So they collected some oral samples uh, for us. So we've been analyzing those and we've analyzed those uh, in parallel with the samples collected the same way from, from, uh, from dogs, from pets, and also from uh, human donors. So you see here, uh, it, it, it's a peak away of based on the 16S uh, V1, V2 region. And essentially every dot is, is one sample. So the, 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 this, the arranging of the, of the samples displays how close the different samples are to each other in terms of composition. And that composition is based on unifrag distances that also takes into account phylogenetic distance between the, or the microbes. So as you can see, the humans are sort of clustered together, relatively together. We get the dogs and the wolves, and actually there's, there's some sort of a, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're mixing a little bit. So definitely there's, there's an interest, you know, it, it supports the idea that, that yeah, a dog, uh, uh, my oral microbes are probably closer to the wolves once than to the humans. Although, I mean, it, it's, it, 
yeah, there's there's uh, we're, we're still working on this to to really look at the statistics and, and everything. And one of the things that we're also doing is building phylogenies based on various microbes that we found in this data. So here is an example of a Porphyromonas phylogenetic tree, where you get the dogs and the wolves uh, with blue and green, and you, you can see that they, they are sharing microbes. So in here, you have a phylotype that's shared between dogs and, and wolves, and it's not present in humans. We also had access to very limited data from bonobos and, and uh, chimps. Uh, and of course, you can see that they go, uh, they we're sharing uh, phylotypes uh, with bonobos and chimps. So there's this phylogeny of the genus Porphyromonas, where we see human primate lineages and we see canine lineages. And we, we, we find these rare. So I put an, uh, an asterisk here where, where there's clearly a canine lineage, but we also actually found the human, uh, human sequences in our sample. So of course, this is way too early to say, but like, you know, maybe it's possible that the, this particular human phylotype, which is in this group that's only canide, maybe this is a microbe that we acquired from, uh, from, uh, from dogs. Um, of, of course, this would take a lot more sampling and looking at, you know, distribution across the human population and so on. But this, this, kind, this is kind of the idea to see, can we, can we trace some potential lateral transfer? And this is, again, it's an ongoing project. So I will end here. Uh, I'd like to, to of course, to, to thank our funding sources, which uh, across all these different projects, uh, DOE and uh, NIH and NSF and NASA. And there's, there's a lot of people over the years, uh, students and, and postdocs and technicians and colleagues at uh, Oak Ridge National Lab, uh, including Carissa. You know, I've listed some in here in, in no particular order. Um, and of course, we have a lot of wonderful collaborators uh, in Portland State, uh, collaborators in, in Iceland for the hot springs there, uh, uh, the Ohio State, uh, collaborators on, on the oral microbiome uh, in Regensburg, uh, Karstetter and, and the others on the Nanorchiota, and then Dieter Sol was was very, very good collaborator on the SR1 uh, recoding uh, project. Uh, and of course, uh, Oak Ridge National Lab, my home institution for, for all the support. So uh, I would, you know, thank you. Uh, I would be glad to take questions. And if anybody is interested in, in potential opportunities, a student or postdoc or uh, at, at Oak Ridge, uh, feel free to contact me. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Podar. So we can take some questions now. You could put something in the chat, raise your hand. I see Dr. Bordenstein has his hand raised, so I'll let you go first. Thanks, Mercha. That was very interesting. It really hit a lot of themes that we think about as well. Um, one area that I'm not an expert in, but it seems like you would be well poised to maybe address is the interactions between archaea and bacteria from the environments you're sampling, the tools you're using to capture the archaea, and whether epibionts with bacteria come out. And if that doesn't happen a lot, then looking at the genomes, how often do you see at least bacterial genes inside archaeal genomes? So if you could talk a little bit about the ecology of those two domains and whether they're swapping genes, um, I'd love to hear it. Uh, sure, that, that's, that's a very interesting question. And I am, I'm really not aware of any interaction that has been discovered between archaea and bacteria. Now, as you know, there's a lot of people that are wondering why aren't there any archaeal pathogens? And uh, there's, there's a lot of hypotheses there, speculations, but I'm not sure we can ever really get the answer to that. Of course, we, there are archaea in the human microbiome. There's, there's methanogens. And some have even speculated that they may be involved in some disease, but they're not really pathogens. Now, um, I think it's been known for a while that there has been lateral transfer. Uh, I believe Metanos or Sinas, they have very large genomes and there's a lot of genes in there that, that appear to have been transferred from, uh, from, other, from thermophilic bacteria like the Thermotogas. Um, I haven't really been following that particular field much, uh, but I'm, I'm convinced that there's a lot of examples out there in the literature of cross-domain uh, LGTs. Yeah. Um, 
but I, I think like you know finding a finding a sort of an interaction between um, uh, between them. Well, actually, hold on. So I believe the the anaerobic methane arc, uh, the anemies uh, that Victoria Orphan at Caltech. I believe that's 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 an archaeal and a and a sulfate reducer. So they found. Like the uh, this technique you have to pull to yeah. pull on the uh, bacterial membrane proteins. Yeah, you know, if you were to do that on 500 archaea, right? It'd really be interesting to see how often do you pull out epibionts, and then who are they? Are they bacteria? Are they archaea? So when you get a huge grant to do that, let me let us know what your results are. Uh, I would say let's try to get that huge grant together. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Let's do it. Because in, in my case, you know, being a DOE, I have to find the DOE hook. Yeah. Uh, and that sometimes it's difficult. Um, so, you know, uh, yeah. Now, um, so here, here's, here would be the difficulty. If we want to try to do it with like specific, like to look for specific proteins, you know, getting a lot of nano, even nanobodies for a lot of proteins, you know, you still have to make that protein synthetically. So it, you know, there, there's costs around it. So you have to make that decision carefully because you joke, can't yeah. really, you know, unless, you know, we, we start up some kind of a company and we get a lot of funding and then we do high throughput, like, you know, to, to synthesize everything and make everything and try them. Sure. That would be, I mean, I, I really believe that, that this, this approach if it can be scaled, and it probably would be hard to scale it up at a PI lab, you know, it would have to be scaled at a bigger facility institution uh -huh. uh, where where one could go, for example, on the human gut, I'm thinking like, you know, it, you one could come up with a couple of, you know, dozens or 100, 200 targets, which appear to be of high value, and then essentially go for all of them, just scale it up, uh, yeah, and even yeah. if only half of them work, it's still um, potentially important. But it is hard to do it at single lab level. But I mean, sure, I, it would be nice to do it. We'll be your second lab. OK. <laughs> All right, we do have one question in the chat. I don't know if the individual wants to pose it themselves, or I can read it. Uh, however. Uh, I will read it, OK. So it says, apologies if this was asked earlier, is the parasitic lifestyle described a long-standing evolutionary strategy between archaea and bacteria or something more ephemeral? Uh, I'm not quite sure if I understand the, the, the question. Uh, so, so, okay, so when, you know, let, let's say if we look at the nano archaea or if we look at any of the system that, that we found, those are clearly they have evolved for a long time because you you can see that they are specific that that the parasite cannot survive on its own and so on. Um, so you could say that they you know they they've been together for for many 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 thousands millions of years, right? Uh, now when you're saying ephemeral, uh, that you know I, I suspect that you might be asking about some kind of a transient association like this you know, my, it's probably would be like non-specific, right? So like, you know, a tick, <laughs> in, you, know, uh, you know, relative to, uh, to the microbes. Uh, and I mean, there are predatory bacteria, right? So um, um, now in this case, uh, Delovibrio, right? For example, it's a predatory bacterium that attacks other gram-negative bacteria and essentially consumes them. Uh, so you could think of that as more ephemeral, you know, it's like the, they, they don't care who they eat, they, they eat anything, right? So there's, there's going to be a difference between sort of specific interaction where you get some kind of a species, species specificity. And in some of those cases, even for the nano archaeota, I think people are reluctant to call it parasite because it doesn't really kill it right away. I mean, and those are lab conditions that we're looking at. So they've co-evolved into this interaction and now people have been like you know is it a commensal well it's not a commensal because the host doesn't seem to the host suffers you know is it a mutualism no it's not because the host can live just fine by itself so i think the defining parasitism in these type of interactions it, it's a little tricky and i mean i used it but yeah there's a caveat 
We have a hand raise if you want to go ahead, Brian. Oh, that was uh, it's a wonderful talk. Uh, very much enjoyed it. Um, I had a question of, you know, about um, you know, the degree to which you might see eukarya in your work. And you know, I'm, I'm thinking about a you know, well-known example of you know, rhizopus, which harbors an intracellular burkholderia inside of it. Burkholderia makes a natural product that allows the rice pathogen to invade rice seedlings. And are there many, do you think, no, first of all, well, two questions. One is like, do you see fungal, fungal interactions? And, you know, and maybe you're not looking, you're looking in the less, less oligotrophic regions and more extremes. So maybe it's not as common. And second is, are there potential intracellular um, bacterial, you know, hiding, uh, bacteria hiding in these microbiomes as well? That's, that's fascinating. And the, the answer to your question is we're, we're not we're not really looking at that. So, um, but it's it's known to I mean of course there's a lot of uh, intracellular symbionts and parasites uh, right uh, in not only in you know in you know insect cells for example but but also in in protists it's it's why it, there's a there's a lot of them and I. Um, I, I know also somebody that works on an intracellular, like I think Burkholderia and related in a, a specific fungus, and I, I forgot the name of the fungus that that's a, uh, that involved in uh, uh, interaction with trees. Uh, so there, there's a lot of intracellular uh, symbionts and parasites when you start looking at eukaryotes. We're not really looking at eukaryotes. There could also be in the human. I mean, there's there's a lot of micro eukaryotes in the human microbiome um i'm yeah i mean i'm i have not really been following that field and it's 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 a hard area of research uh, and and i'm sure there will be a lot of interesting things that are gonna they're gonna come from that um now you're saying potentially also intracellular parasites or symbionts in actual archaea or nano or or, or bacteria and that's I think that actually happens. And that could, in many cases, also be a reason why we're not necessarily detecting them too easily because they might be hiding inside. And there is a, uh, there, there's a paper from a uh, Moreira lab in, um, in, in Spain and in, in the, uh, I got the other author, um, um, Purificacion Gar uh, Lopez Garcia, I believe. And they looked at an S, they actually found an SR1 that's parasitic to another bacterium. And I think it, it actually can, can go inside. So it's, it's possible that for some of these parasitic bacteria from these lineages, they might not, not necessarily only sit on the surface like what we see with nanoarchaeum, they actually might be digging in and going inside. Uh, but in order to see that, you actually have to grow them. So if we find a way to somehow, then that will make it difficult because if they go inside, then our antibodies or nanobodies are not going to have access to the target. So that is, that is an Achilles heel to, the, to this concept. Uh, but hopefully at some point they're on the outside. <laughs> yeah, that's what they did with uh, fungi. They fixed and perm them and then they were able to, to stain the Burkhold area living inside of the, the, the mycelia. But of course they're much bigger, so. Yeah, and and then you kill them in the process. So, yeah, but but if you can grow them or at least get enough from the environment to to study them, and you don't have to grow them in pure culture, of course. Uh, if you have a way to to study them, then thank, thank you. you, thank you. Any other questions? All right, if there are no more questions, then we can thank Dr. Podar again. And uh, thank you all for coming. Thank, thank you. Thank you for hosting. This was fun and hope to see you uh, live. It's, you know. <laughs> Thanks, Mircha. Great talk. Okay. Thanks.